Thanks for joining us this afternoon uh, for the panel looking at HBCUs ending uh, the era of half measures, particularly looking at uh, the systemic in inequities that uh, HBCUs have uh, have been subjected to over the years, and then also how the Biden administration and also the members of Congress are looking to remedy this. Um, with us, we are we are joined with uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Representative Alma Adams, uh, founder of the HBCU caucus, and also the White House's uh, senior advisor to the president and director of outreach, Cedric Richmond. Uh, both have a long history of helping and advocating for HBCUs, so we're delighted that they can join us and share their insight. And so we'll start with you, Representative Adams. Uh, you, you're as I mentioned, you you chair the the HBCU caucus. Um, you you have different bills and vehicles uh, right now on the pipe in the pipeline. The Ignite Act being one of those uh, to look at helping HBCUs. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and in your work? Well, first of all, let me uh, uh, bring greetings from my 12th district here in North Carolina and all of the citizens I represent and from the Congressional Bipartisan HBCU Caucus. We're bipartisan, we're bicameral, 109 members now, and uh, dedicated all to the cause of making sure that HBCUs and their students survive. I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, all of my the folks who are a part of this today, as well as my co-chair, Representative Hill, and then our, our senior advisor to President Cedric Richmond, the great state of Louisiana, who uh, I've had the privilege of serving with in the House. I'm a two-time graduate of an HBCU, North Carolina A&T, 40 years at Bennett College as a professor and administrator there. So I have a really good insight as to HBCUs and how important they are. Now, I'm going to tell you that when I came to Congress, I wanted to continue my support uh, for HBCUs, and uh, which is why I started the first, uh, the bipartisan HBCU caucus. And uh, we've worked um, very, um, diligently to make sure that um, uh, we kind of keep HBCUs out there. Uh, but so th let me just speak a moment since you asked me about Ignite. We're doing a number of things, and right now our focus is on uh, the Ignite HBCU Excellence Act, and um, it's going to authorize a new grant program, and every HBCU can compete for funding uh, for various purposes, from renovation to repair, modernization, or construction of, of new campus facilities, including installing high-speed high speed broadband. Now, you know, we know that our schools are almost two centuries old, uh, and many of their buildings are. Uh, and so we have some really serious issues on our campus in terms of infrastructure across this um, United States. There are about 102. Uh, HBCUs, uh, and they are in serious need of repair on their campuses, $25 billion uh, in deferred maintenance. And why? Because we've not gotten the kind of funding uh, that other schools have received, and we've done the best that we could do with the little that we've had, uh, but yet we've still been able to educate some very fine uh, young people. So. Uh, we're pushing forward. Uh, we've got, uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of the infrastructure bill, but I just believe uh, that we cannot leave out our HBCUs. We need, an, we need um, to build back better, but we also need to make sure that in building back better, that we build our HBCUs back better too, because they were the schools who educated people that look like me, you, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Cedric Richmond here, uh, when other schools would not let us in. We were founded for the purpose of educating black kids and, um, and f before 1964. So that's, that's been that's kind of a unique situation for our schools. Uh, we are HBCU strong, and of course we want to continue uh, to have the opportunity to remain strong, to, to survive, uh, but also to thrive. 
Gotcha. And and Director Richmond, I mean, the White House is has a record number of HBCU graduates, including yourself and Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, speaking to Representative Adams' point as well, uh, President Biden has consistently invoked HBCUs, talked about the talent in the pipeline with HBCUs, and also said that he wants to put uh, you know HBCUs in the center of his overall you know this 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 centerpiece of equity that, that you all are, are looking to, to address. Can you talk about some of the initiatives that the White House uh, has in the pipeline for HBCUs, the vision that you and the president have uh, for helping uh, these institutions? Well, we have a president now who uh, consistently talks about racial equity and breaking down systemic racism. You heard him say it in his inaugural address and an address to a joint session of Congress. And so you can't tackle systemic racism and racial equity without bolstering up and investing in HBCU. So uh, through the American Rescue Plan, you saw us put about $4.2 billion into uh, our HBCUs, uh, which was uh, probably the largest investment in history. Uh, but it's not, and it can't be a one-off Thing. It has to be consistent. So that's why you saw uh, us propose $239 million in our budget for HBCUs, including about $72 uh, million in discretionary spending. HBCUs, and, and this is what uh, I really want to stress, if you look at uh, African-American doctors, lawyers, teachers, and others, uh, a lot of those... Uh, a lot of those professionals come through HBCUs and they play a very critical role. And so as we shape our future, uh, HBCUs are gonna have to uh, play a bigger role because what they do is unique and vitally important. So we're gonna continue to invest in HBCUs and we're gonna put uh, money where our mouth is. Sure. And Representative Adams, you kind of alluded to uh, some of the uh, infrastructure uh, opportunities here, uh, particularly exposed uh, throughout, I mean, our entire education system uh, with COVID kind of exposed uh, some of these deficiencies broadly, but uh, of course, acutely with uh, some of the HBCUs. What are some of the challenges uh, that you've uh, heard from leaders of the institutions and what are some of the opportunities that you think that we can address uh, pretty quickly here? Well, thank you very much for your question. And again, I, I just appreciate uh, President Biden's uh, interest and support for HBCUs and all the things that uh, we currently have. And he mentioned the, uh, the different uh, pieces of legislation that we've had. Clearly, they've helped us to eliminate some of the debt on these campuses, uh, to provide scholarships to students. But I'd be remiss if I didn't first elaborate on the infrastructure challenges that many of the presidents and chancellors have shared with me. Uh, most of the HBCUs, if not all of them, have difficulty in terms of the difficult financial situations. Um, after years of underfunding, institutional neglect, many of the buildings have ruptured pipes and broken sidewalks and campus blackouts and buildings that aren't climate controlled. So these are physical manifestations of the lack of funding that funding that HBCUs face. So when they do receive grant funding, sometimes that funding is really, most of the time, is much less than their predominantly white institution counterparts. And so they've got to make choice, tough choices. And so they have to decide whether to invest in their students, their faculty, or in their physical infrastructure. Uh, most of our schools have chosen to invest in their students because folks who work at HBCUs are passionate about their colleges. So if you look at what they've done in the midst of the pandemic, despite their limited resources, their chances, they've canceled student debt and, and all these things. But that shows the commitment that our schools have. That's why I stayed at Bennett College for 40 years. But we've got to remove that false choice that there's uh, no reason, in my opinion, why half of the HBCU facilities need repair or replacement. So uh, we've heard from leadership also that in addition to those uh, infrastructure challenges that uh, they are disadvantaged when competing for public and private resources. So when they have to compete for grants and contracts, they're forced to compete with larger, better resourced institutions. And so that's why uh, this bill that we're talking about is very important and that we make sure 
that it has the kind of equity in there in terms of, of competing. So we shouldn't have to fight for crumbs. We've been under resourced for so many years, but we've got to build on the sources of institutional aid programs that currently exist. And, and if we do this uh, with the goal of creating opportunity for students, uh, then our schools and our young people will be better off. Yes. And, and Director Richmond, uh, as you alluded to, the, the talent pipeline, the doctors, the lawyers, but then again, uh, you all at the White House last week just highlighted uh, a lot of the talent there in the administration as well. We know that representation matters. We know uh, that, that perception matters as well. And so there are success stories, uh, plenty of success stories emanating out of HBCUs, yours, and Vice President Harris is being one of them. What does that mean that there are are so many HBCU alums in the administration, and how do you seize that moment and seize that type of momentum that we're seeing? Well, I think that uh, it's our values. And if you look at um, HBCU representation in the administration, it's significant because uh, we were intentional about doing it. If you look at Michael Reagan uh, over the EPA, He's a North Carolina a and graduate, and he's over the Environmental Protection Agency, and which is very important to communities of color uh, if you look at environmental uh, justice. So we, again, uh, look at racial equity as one of our main pillars of this administration, and if you're going to do it, you have to make sure that you have talented African Americans at the table because this is not an administration that thinks that we're going to help black people in spite of black people. Actually, what we think is we're going to invite uh, and really uh, push African Americans to be at the table to be co-architects of their future because nobody knows uh, what they need better uh, than African Americans. And so if you look at the vice president, if you look at the White House, uh, we really want to make sure that uh, we have African Americans at the table in real meaningful positions and not just leadership positions shaping the African-American community, but shaping the nation and domestic uh, and foreign policy as well. And so we want to make sure that people understand uh, in a very clear manner, crystal clear matter of fact, what HBCUs mean to this country. We've underfunded uh, public education, K through 12, uh, forever. And HBCUs take those students and uh, they polish them into uh, fine gems, leaders in the community, leaders around the world, and it makes the country a better place. And so uh, you heard Congresswoman Adams talk about it. These schools have, uh, their infrastructure plan has been duct tape and glue uh, for uh, decades. And w just imagine what they could do if we invest uh, real money in them so that they can build uh, state-of-the-art infrastructure, state-of-the-art state of the art science labs and all of those things. I mean, look, we have never, ever in the African community, community equated uh, wealth with talent. Uh, however, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we enjoy being underfunded in our uh, endeavor to educate African Americans. And so this administration understands that. We're going to invest in it. And I think the, uh, the sky's the limit where we go from there. Yeah, yeah. if I can add something, you know, uh, in, in terms of um, the, the value of these young students who graduate from HBCUs and, and having alumni at the highest levels of government, uh, such as uh, uh, Advisor Richmond and, and, and Vice President Harris, that's a great thing because it, 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 it draws the awareness to HBCUs, to their narrative, and, and to the needs that we have. So it's valuable to have uh, alums in the highest uh, echelons of government. Uh, you can be what you see. So students will be able to see what's possible with an education at an HBCU. Uh, for me, you know, I, I walked the ghetto streets of Newark, New Jersey. My mom did domestic work. Uh, we didn't have any money, first generation. Uh, I was able to complete a bachelor's and master's from North Carolina A&T going to get my PhD from The Ohio State University. Why? Because of the North Carolina a and and HBCU. So, you know, oftentimes our schools face this perception of being less than. So having alumni in those places, uh, such as in the White House, um, 
does acknowledge the opportunities that an HBC uh, education can provide. So uh, I just wanted to add that and just say that, again, as I tell young people, you can be what you see, so they've got to see it. And you all operate, of course, in uh, the halls of Washington and move with the gears uh, out here in, in D.C. Uh, is there a role that the private sector, that uh, that individuals can play uh, in helping uh, move along some of these initiatives? Well, I Absolutely. think there's... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I'll be very quick. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you look at other institutions that have billion-dollar endowments, uh, for the private sector can make sure that uh, they level the playing field in that way. They can give money to institutions that are going to use it. The return on the investment is enormous. And so when they look at HBCUs, uh, my push would be uh, to invest serious dollars in those institutions. And so it gives them capacity building and all the other things that uh, they can do. And I think it's a, a wise investment. I think it's a needed investment. And I just encourage uh, to the extent that ethics allows me uh, to encourage those companies to do that. Yeah, you know, let me just add, businesses can, you know, we can support HBCUs in, in a variety of ways. Uh, Cedric has mentioned some, uh, but businesses can recruit on HBCU campuses. They can hire HBCU graduates. You know, you're hearing a lot today about private sector companies uh, that are beginning to reevaluate, rethink the value of diversity uh, in the wake of racial just the racial just justice movement across the country. Uh, they're now actively seeking to recruit diverse talent. And so because uh, I recognize that and some of my colleagues and I, we, you know, the, the um, partnership challenge uh, began because of that, uh, which gets the private sector involved, the HBCU uh, uh, partnership challenge does give the private sector an opportunity, first of all, recognize the importance and the impact of HBCUs to the economy, to the principles of corporate diversity and inclusion. Uh, and then it, it asks that that recognition, as Cedric has said, be supported by greater investment, greater engagement, to ensure that the HBCUs can continue to prepare diverse talent for our workforce. If you're looking for, the, for, for, for uh, young people who can do all of these things, who've been who've had uh, tremendous uh, academic uh, support. Uh, the pipeline is, is with the HBCU. So our partnership challenge right now, we have over 71 members. It spans across uh, industries such as tech, financial sector, agriculture, and telecom. And we recently had some to join uh, the challenge uh, just, uh, just this week. So I do as well encourage businesses to uh, invest in, in, in both um, uh, action to uplift the, the role of these schools and, and to understand the, 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 the enormous role that they play economically as well as academically and societally. Mm -hmm. Are there challenges um, with uh, some of these vehicles, these legislative vehicles, in terms of uh, reaching bipartisanship consensus at all? Do, uh, are HBCUs uh, subjected to that type of uh, partisan, bi uh, partisanship at all, or uh, are things pretty seamless? Well, let me, let me begin by saying uh, really most of our HBCUs, because of the uh, the way the, the, the districts have been drawn and redrawn and gerrymandering and all those things, most of them uh, really live in Republican districts. So I've never believed that, uh, that education is a partisan issue. Uh, we all, you, you need to have it, whether you're talking about four-year education or, um, uh, you, you know, anything else. I mean, you really need to be prepared for uh, the world of work, regardless of what you're going to do. But but I've got to tell you that basically um, I've had the experience of working uh, across the aisles, and I think that uh, that that my Republican colleagues are beginning to uh, realize that uh, we do have, uh, you know, there's a lot of value in these schools. So if you look at the at night bill. Uh, all of the, the partners that we have, uh, we've got over 97 members, uh, co-sponsors of that bill. Um, again, I mentioned the numbers of folks who uh, have taken on the partnership challenge and so forth. So 
um, my coach, and, and we, we have coaches. For example, my coach here in the house is, is Representative Hill. We have, uh, and then I have, we have vice chairs uh, in the house, also uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, Terry Sewell on the Democrat side, Representative Turner on the Republican side. And then in the Senate, uh, we we have uh, Senator Coons, who is a sponsor, uh, a co-sponsor of this bill, along with uh, Senator Tim Scott. So we, um, we, we're we doing pretty good there, uh, but I think, it, again, it's about educating people and helping them to understand not only the value that we bring, but the discrimination uh, financially in terms of support from government uh, that we've seen over the years that have really helped us, have really not helped our schools do what we know uh, they can do. And, and Advisor Richmond, how do you see the, the White House's role in terms of prodding Congress to move some of this legislation along? Uh, of course, uh, the, the president has uh, his uh, care packages uh, in terms of uh, human infrastructure uh, that's uh, been a, a big centerpiece of the administration's efforts. How do you see uh, the White House's involvement in terms of just kind of prodding Congress on these issues? Well, one, we have to include it in uh, all the things that we send to uh, Congress, and we have to make sure that they understand it's a priority. And uh, the Congresswoman has been a leader on HBCU uh, initiatives and uh, making sure that she keeps them at the forefront. And we're going to continue to support her and her work on the Education and Labor Committee under uh, Bobby Scott to make sure that it's important. It's been an important issue for the Congressional Black Caucus since its inception. And I think that Congresswoman Adams has taken it to the next level. So a uh, part of it is for us to, one, uh, continue to push, but one, to publicly advocate for it so people know exactly where we stand in terms of making sure that uh, HBCUs have, uh, have the resources and the investment that they need uh, to succeed. So we view it as a partnership with Congress, and we will continue to uh, tell them that it's a priority and support where we can. What do you all say to uh, those that that, that would that would posit that HBCUs have served their function and in 2021 uh, with uh, you know integration, et cetera, that they don't have a role to play going forward? What would you all say to those uh, those type of criticisms? Well, I would say you need to do your research. <laughs> HBCUs are still absolutely necessary, even in 2021. We know why the schools were created. Uh, they're needed now uh, just as much as they were uh, when, when, we, when we organized uh, many of these schools in the basements of churches and so forth. But the doors of HBCUs are open to all students today. But the existence of, of our HBCUs continue to serve as a reminder of why we were created in the first place. Why? Because students who looked like us could not go anywhere else. They were created in the face of slavery, and they continue to shine bright in the face of segregation. So they're still needed today uh, to remind us of where we were, where we, where we are now, and where we should go, always toward equality and equity. So Furthermore, uh, HBCUs have dedicated faculty and staff to support students. And I know this personally because of the teaching that I, I did at Bennett College for four years, because of the educational experiences and the support I received at North Carolina A&T. Going in as a student who was not fully uh, academically prepared, but they, they, they made an investment in me. Uh, they they uh, saw something in me. They they, they molded and shaped me into what they knew I could become. And that's what HBCUs are still doing today. So students uh, have the opportunity to learn uh, at our unique colleges and universities, which really offer strong academic training and a window into, into living history. So yes, we need to keep our HBCUs uh, not just uh, surviving, but thriving. I would just say that we need we need them now more than ever. If you look at uh, under-resourced public schools, if you look at the products that they're turning out across the country, uh, this is how uh, I judge HBCUs, and I got this from uh, Dr. Kembro at Dillon University. We should look at it like an Olympic diving. If you jump off the diving board and you just do an easy dive, no splash, you're not going to get a very high score because it had zero degree of difficulty. 
And if you look at the product or the input that uh, HBCUs get coming from these under-resourced uh, public schools around the country, and they get students that are academically, some students are uh, academically uh, not necessarily ready, but they take them, they push them, they nurture them, they vest in them, they sow in them, and they produce great leaders. And so I think now, if, if you look at it, uh, it is something that we absolutely need uh, right now. And so uh, my position would be that they are uh, very much needed right now. And as we talk about diversity and inclusion, and we push this social justice agenda and, and equity, we need those leaders from HBCUs to uh, lead uh, that movement because that's what they have been taught to do at HBCUs. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, I think that's a proper way to end this this panel. Want to thank again uh, Representative Adams and also the White House's uh, senior advisor to the president, Cedric at Cedric Richmond, for the time today. Really do appreciate your time and your valuable insight, both of you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much, HBCU Strong. Cedric, I'll be in touch with you. Okay? Absolutely. I'll be reaching out to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you, Mark. Have a good day.